You're listening to Paris Search UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to Kerry Greenaway and Mark Manley on the Dark Mirror Paranormal Show. Only on Parasearch UK Radio. A good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Dark Mirror Show. I'm flying solo tonight because my co-host, Mark Manley, is sick. He's got man flu. So I've brought in some of the troops and I have got <laughs> Kerry Ann. Good evening, Kerry. Good evening. I've got Jay Lynch. Howdy. <laughs> and I have brought Andy Mercer in as well. So good evening, Andy. Good evening. So we're going to have oh, a general no chat. Care. I think is how we're going to do this show tonight. I think we're going to have a general <laughs> chit chat about all things paranormal on this Good Friday. Just paranormal, go, no lads demons. And ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Andy. Okay. Oh, hush. So- we were I was just, last... to... oh. I was just going to very, very briefly say the Voynich manuscript dated from the Middle Ages almost certainly was either a lost cipher manuscript with encoded information which is either the key to crack it or a complete fantasy fake in order to dupe people into buying it to make lots of money. It certainly is for the mid to late 1400s. It is primarily about um, herbal remedies and herbal medicine and also some uh, biological information about supposed creatures. There has been vague suggestions it might have shown people of aliens, but that's probably just an interpretation of very strange little drawings. Otherwise, it's an interesting manuscript. End of show. There we go. Okay, now, that's, that, that's sorted. We've cleared that one up. We've debunked that within about two minutes. Thanks, Andy, for that, which is why <laughs> this is why we're not talking about the Voynich manuscript tonight. <laughs> I've banned him from listening to that show when we do it, Mark, so don't worry. I've actually banned Andy Mercer from the chat room on that particular oh, wow. show. <laughs> Well, one quick point I'd like to make very briefly as well is um, John Dee's name was attached to it. Now, as you guys probably know, I've wrote a book on John Dee's Enochian system, so it's something I've looked at in great detail. Often what happens is John Dee's name gets attached to lots of things with medieval and um, Elizabethan times because he's so famous and so noted in the sort of cult world. But he certainly didn't own it because he had kept meticulous records of all the, the documents he actually owned, manuscripts and books, etc., and there's no mention of it anywhere. There's been a suggestion that some of the numbering on the pages, which was certainly added later on, maybe in, in his handwriting. I, I don't quite see how that conclusion is reached, because it's just writing numbers, and you can't get someone's handwriting just from writing numbers. You need a much more fluent script of someone's writing. Um, I can't remember the name of the author, a fairly recent guy who tried to link both Francis Bacon and John Dee to the manuscript claiming that Bacon actually wrote it, and John Dee was involved in it. Again, it's pure speculation. Unfortunately, there's no evidence as yes, it's the case. I say that the primary reason because if Dee had it or was involved in it, he would have written about it without a doubt. Out. So that's the last bit I'll say on that matter. So. Okay, well, maybe we won't do the Voynich manuscript. <laughs> we don't have it. It took seven minutes. <laughs> seven Which minutes, and we, we've already we've discussed it. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, Just in we case all... someone had tuned in specifically for the manuscript, I thought I'd better mention This is true. <laughs> this is very true. But I didn't think it was fair because Mark has done a lot of research on, um, on the manuscript. Um, mm mm-hmm. And um, I know we spoke about it privately, didn't we, Andy? And um, I, I just didn't think it was fair to do a subject that he's, he's worked hard. But he's, he's dying in his bed with man flu, guys. I mean, man flu, it's a killer, you know. Terrible. 
There is a very good website, and I'll send it over to Mark if he's not seen it. That goes into a lot of detail. I mean, you want to do the show about it? Absolutely, do a show because it's it is a fascinating topic. Because there's a lot of history behind the manuscript, what it's changed hands, and what's been done with it. But I just thought I'd try to pen anything in case someone has tuned in to hear about it. So, yeah, that's that's very true, and it is unfortunate that my lovely Mark is is poorly. Um, but I am warning you, Andy. If we do do a show, I'm banning you from the <laughs> chat room. <laughs> Wow! <laughs> Don't you agree, guys? Back me up on this, please. Hey, that's Fine, actually one I've never had happen. I've never been banned from a chat room. <laughs> oh, I, I, have. Have. I have before. Don't worry about that. I was banned from another show. Not this network, a different network, because um, the, the guest on there was, was uncomfortable with my presence, so I had to miss a show. Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> You're so I'm entertained. Going to to <laughs> oh, dear. So anyway, guys, it's Good Friday. Yes, it's it's Easter. always good when it's a Friday. It Absolutely, is. <laughs> and we're jail now. <laughs> Every Friday is good. About, um, I was thinking about something that we can have a general chit chat, paranormal wise, about. Last night we spoke about um, the equipment side of things, and I thought it would be a good idea to because everyone works differently, different areas, and we all have different techniques. So. I was wondering if what what would be I'll start with Andy first. What would be your ideal piece of equipment that you use on investigations, or do you even use equipment when you go out and investigate? Well, I've been on the journey of investigating with equipment. It got to the point with my old investigation team, which I closed down about ten years ago now, that we actually spent more time setting everything up than actually carrying out the investigation. We had so much equipment. It got to the point we had uh, video camcorders, cameras, obviously, um, audio equipment set up, we had various meters and readings and computer um, analysis that was going on at the time with these little pot things a friend found that fed all this data into the computer and you could just watch the data. And it got very boring, to be honest with you. It, was, it lost its kind of fun and adventure side. It was just setting up equipment and leaving it running. So um, these days, I tend to use primarily me, my brain and my eyes and ears. I do occasionally take along audio equipment because I find, for me, the most fascinating now is trying to capture stuff audible and, and vis- visually with a camcorder. But even that I can't be bothered with half the time. So for me, it's mainly audio. What I tend to do is record the entire event. I don't just sort of step there with a recorder and wave it around and ask questions. I'll have the entire event recorded. And often when I used to do the um, Fright Night type events, the public ones, I'd have like eight, ten hours of recordings to listen through, which I used to listen to during my lunch break when I was working back in the day. And um, see if I captured anything and very very rarely but just occasionally there was a strange anomalous recordings of voices and other sounds but if i take anything at all these days aside from the obvious torch it tends to be the field recorder which i'm using to talk to you guys now because it does pick up a very wide range and a very high quality sound and does pick up some very small distant noises like that furniture being moved that you can actually hear things in the distance and when you know that you're the only people in the area and you hear voices in the distance and it's a low it's a a remote location like in a couple of recordings i've actually got you think oh that's pretty good i remember one particular one where there was only eight or nine of us all together in the same one part of Ma- woodchester mansion which is about a mile and a half from the nearest other house i actually asked the question aloud um, can anyone hear me and a voice very clear in the distance says i can very clear woman's voice and it's those kind of recordings that when you hear them they still give you chills and the first time you capture something they're the one thing that real still stands out for me when I actually capture something like that. And it's, it's fairly rare. I mean, the last, last bit, the, the most recent investigations I've been on, I've not picked up a damn thing, which is a real shame because I do like finding those oddities. But in 15, 20 years of actively recording stuff, either by camcorder or mini disc recorder, which I used to use, which are often overlooked as a good piece of equipment, mini disc recorders, because again, they record for hours at a time, very high quality, better than your average dictaphone, and they're still fairly cheap if you can get one that does recording. And then now, the field recorder with this thing, which for a memory card can last for absolute hours, and I still listen out and listen through the recorder to see if I've captured anything of note or value or, or interest, but it is remarkably rare. And in all the time I've been doing this, I've got about probably about 15, 20 clips, if that many. But I would say I cannot explain this. I really can't. And as soon as I get an idea of that might have been caused by X, Y, Z, it's discounted because of that possibility remains. But once I am certain there's no other explanation other than it being something anomalous or paranormal, then I think, well, that's pretty good. 
So for me, it's I've gone for the full gamut of mini disc recorders, camcorders with dual infrared lights, all that kind of stuff, to actual just audio equipment, to just using the field recorder now, if I remember to turn it on, which I've forgotten before, <laughs> which I must admit sometimes I thought, oh, it's blank, I forgot to turn it on. But that's been it for me, really. Okay. Jay, Jay what's well, your favourite bit? Okay. My favorite piece of gear, like I'm kind of like Andy, just a simple auto recorder. I don't, I do live EVP, listen to it while it's recording. So mainly just so I can hear better. But yeah, I don't, I don't use a whole lot of, I, I put it all the way. I, I really have because so much of the equipment is just the same thing over and over again. And, and then and you're not really advancing in our technology. We're just re, reconfiguring it into another shape. So I've kind of, stepped away from all that and the best piece of equipment like you said is the human body mm. yeah right. yeah I right. agree. Right. yes i agree i do agree with the human body being the ultimate tool because you know we've we spoken earlier or we have spoken with uh someone that says you know the body does everything that the um that tools do uh, individually um but i really enjoy the spirit box i enjoy the spirit box i enjoy k2 and i like the pendulum for the um more basic kind of uh bit of kit um i think the more complicated things get the harder it is for me to follow which sounds like a really kind of silly thing to say um but i do like um like the basic kind of stuff that you know you know where it is you are with it you know you don't have to like spin this turn that turn around four times touch an eye bend down you know it's just a switch on and off you go <laughs> and that's what i want i want that i want to be able to switch it on and enjoy what i'm doing because i'm not a techie but i enjoy the um evidence that i get from some of the technology and you gotta admit some of the things that are out at the moment literally it's like ugh, flying a plane i know that's a really extreme kind of example but it does seem to be yeah. I don't know if you guys agree with that. Yeah, Jay's absolutely. talked yeah, about this before, hasn't he? He said, like, do you really need an all singing, all dancing, really high expensive piece of kit which does the same job as a basic, you know, a basic model? He, 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 you know, that's what Jay was saying my, my before. Biggest, yeah. Uh, my biggest thing is, is these multi pieces of equipment. They're just so gimmicky they truly are when you you have yeah. was it the, the ghost arc that came over from italy and stuff over here people over here was buying it up like crazy and and when they got it there's some of the a, a guy that i know that's been investigating for a long time he's very techy because he that's what he does he's in he does it work and thing and he builds systems and stuff but he noticed that when he was turning on a couple other pieces that was going like the uh, emf detector and something else the temperature gates start going up because, come to find out, none of the circuitry inside was actually shielded. So you're having all these things crammed in such a condensed spot. Sounds great, but you're getting false readings and false information from your own equipment. Absolutely. I'll just briefly tell a little story from this. is a good 10, 12 years ago now. Um, a company who I shall not name, because it's not really fair, was selling um, ghost hunting equipment, including a version of VMF meters, etc. That that looked they looked quite basic. They looked like they've been made by hand and not really sort of machine created. Um, have very basic LED lights on and aerials attached. And a, a friend of mine bought the equipment and gave it to a friend of his who was a, a sound engineer. He took it apart and said, "This is nothing. This is just a machine creating random light flashes. It's not responding to anything. This area is not attached to anything. This is just random light." Lights flashing, and this is being sold as a ghost detector. And so this is just ridiculous. And I, I think the word got out then that said company disappeared. But they'd sold quite a few of these units before it was really recognised that these things did nothing. They were literally just random flashing lights. And this, you know, it comes back to a bit like we talked about last night about conmen in this field. And unfortunately, it's a field that is quite open to having um, conmen moving into it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You, you need. I mean, I quite like, I mean, if we're talking tech, I mean, you know, I'm a spiritual crystal baby in the field, really. But I quite like the spirit box. I'm, I am a fan of that one. Just a basic <laughs> spirit box. I can't press buttons, though. I'm awful in the dark pressing buttons. <clears throat> Somebody has to sort I, we, of set it all up and then I'll go, OK, I can. <laughs> but but we, we use spirit boxes every once in a while, while Teresa uses it more than what I do. And I still have 
a lot of questions and skepticisms about it. I mean, it, it depends on what, it doesn't even matter which ones you're using. We've used several different types, whether it's, whether it be the SP7, SP11, Hack Shack, it doesn't matter to me. You're scanning radio frequencies. Oh, that's what you're talking about. I, was, I must admit, I've not been on many investigations the last few years. I did sort of drop out for quite a while. And I didn't even know what you were talking about at first. Now, oh. I, you know, I think they're ridiculous. He's <laughs> silly. You mean, you're going to get, it doesn't matter where you are, you're going to pick up random frequencies of radio records and um, blasts of information and digital stuff flying all over the place. So of course, you're going to pick up random things like voices and people saying things. And it's paradoxical of the year more often than not. If someone says, oh, I've heard that. And you think, oh, yeah. Oh, no, I can hear what you're saying. Yeah, I can hear that now. But once you've heard it, you can't not hear it. It's, it's there in your head. So I'm not a big fan of those things, I have to be honest with you. I really feel that they can be pick up just about anything. I think and and you, you have the newer ones. Well, well, you I have the newer ones now that's one... going for like 600 bucks. They're crazy. Yeah, when you've got them mm. running, it's you're, you're actually listening for a voice that goes over revolutions rather than through, like, odd words. Because, like you say, you can pick up radio signals. But if you get... Because it's going... That's my impression of a spirit box. I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> if you get someone speaking over a revolu- you know, a couple of revolutions, you know that's not bleed over from... You know, radio signal. Well, to be perfectly honest, unless you really are a tech in the field, no, you don't know that. We we, we don't know exactly how these things are working. We don't exactly know how the the the, the transmission bleeds occur. You know, we're not high tech in, in t- the know all the things about these kinds of areas. So, you know, I really want the proper sound engineer, uh, broadcast engineer, to actually tell me, no, this has got to be coming from somewhere other than a, a random signal just being picked up because we don't know that. Mm. To be yeah, honest, that's you know, true. I, mean, I suppose that's true. I mean, I don't. I tell you what, I don't <coughs> like in the field. I do not like apps. I'm not a fan yes. at all of apps I, on I, mobile well, phones. I don't. Can't see how any of them could really be producing what they're supposed to be producing. I just, you know, it's a, it's a mobile phone for the end of the day. You know how it's, with an app you can so easily fake it. There's nothing to even detect. I mean, I saw my friend years ago buying that equipment, taking it apart, having it analysed and being told no, it's random lights. You, know, you can do that. With an app you can't do that. You've got no way of verifying if it's a genuine item or if it's just a load of nonsense. There really is no way at all. I mean, someone once said to me, it depends on the word base that's been programmed into it. And if you're selling a paranormal investigation tool, then the word base could be based around words that are likely to occur in a paranormal mm-hmm. investigation. So you would need to know your word base of the program before you'd be able to verify whether or not you're getting just, you know, um, like random paranormal linked words or whether or not there's a whole dictionary programmed into it. Um, that's what someone said to me. If you've got a whole um, dictionary programmed into it, then it reduces the chance of um, relevant words coming through the app. Do you see what I mean? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. If it's you're, just you're picking li- words out, but if it's only programmed for paranormal, then <clears throat> the chances are you're going to get a higher chance of hits on what's relevant to your location. Mm. But you could use it absolutely anywhere, and any random collection of words could be coming out. I mean, next day you're walking around Asda's or Tesco's, try it out and see what you pick up. You know, does that mean yeah, Asda or Tesco's? True. That's that's a good point. <laughs> I can you imagine that <laughs> walking around Asda's, haunted <laughs> forest? <laughs> you know, what I mean? you're like, out, you're I'm right by the salad with... section. That must be relevant. <laughs> 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 but that's a fair point. It is a fair point. No, <laughs> not talking about the uh, spirit boxes. We we actually challenged him one time and did an experiment where I put on a noise reducing headset and put the into the spirit box and I turned it up as loud as I could possibly take it so that way I couldn't hear anybody in the room asking questions. And all I did was sit there and concentrate on what I heard and say every word that I heard, no matter what, no matter what, what it was, whether it was profanity or not, and see if those words actually consider, uh, went along with the lines of what the question was that they were asking, if they answered their questions. It did. If I can't... And, and a couple of times it seemed like it did, but but you have random chances of it happening every once in a while. Can it happen on a more consistent thing? Because if the person wearing listening to the spirit box, that ghost hack, shack, whatever you want to call it, if they have on a headset and they can't hear the question in the room and they're just re- saying everything that they think is a word coming through, they and the other people are asking the questions, what if it does start hitting on a consistency then? Hmm. 
Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you can't investigate, or you can investigate without any tools whatsoever, but you're not going to capture anything. Mm-hmm. But you want to do your best yeah. to capture. And I think one of the questions interact. you can ask yourself is, what is it you're trying to capture? Who are you trying to convince? Because I think we can also, without any shadow of a doubt, that if you believe in this stuff, you don't need convincing. If you don't, nothing's going to convince you. You know, over the years of being involved in this stuff, there there are one or two occasions when I can think of when I've been on events, investigations, where someone's come along a disbelieving sceptic and gone in and thinking, wow, I really experienced something. I think I believe this stuff now. Two at the absolute most I can think of. You know, I think it's it's nice to capture stuff, photographs, audio, etc., for yourself, you know. But if you're not capturing anything, then you're not catching anything, but I don't think you're ever going to convince anybody else of this unless they actually really believe themselves. If they don't believe, they're never going to believe. It's a, it's a variation of the old saying. Of Edgar Cayce originally um, coined it, that, you know, for a, a believer, no evidence is necessary. For a sceptic, no evidence is enough. You know, that is still the case. It's so very rarely... People come into this field, I think, of a predetermined mindset. They don't... It evolves and changes. I mean, I'll be honest, I used to believe in a lot, lot more than I do now, but I'm still not... I wouldn't say I've ruled everything out, but I am quite skeptical of a lot of things. But I've had enough strange experiences myself to know there's reality to this, but a lot of it is... It's, it is imagination, it's pareidolia, it's, you know, it's, it's wanting to see things, cognitive bias, etc., etc. But, you know, I don't think I'll ever convince anybody. I mean, I've... I don't want to go on about it, but I've got this piece of video footage which I think you guys have all seen in the Edinburgh vaults of the shadow figure on the back wall of one of the chambers that we all know there was nobody in that chamber. We all know exactly where everybody was. And yet, you know, I can show it to people and the first thing they're going to say is, oh, no, there was somebody who didn't spot them. Well, I can say, well, I know there was. Well, how do I know you know there was? How, you know, you, I said, well, you have to believe me. I said, well, you don't believe me. Then. Well, no, I don't know. I wasn't there. How can I say if I believe you or not? You know, there's a, a way of pooing it very easily. But yet, I know full well. There was nobody in the room at the time. There was just um, the six of the group were in another part of the vaults, and there was this shadow figure on the back wall moving across. But it's never going to be anybody else. And I think we've lost Kerry. Oh, dear. Yeah, we have. Unfortunately, she's had to drop out. Um, I think, though, I think you're right there. Whatever evidence you capture on an investigation, if you put it out there into the public domain, there's always, always going to be a thousand mm. other people going, no. Nah. Because yeah. they weren't there, they didn't experience it, they don't know the conditions it was done, they don't know, um, you know, who was, where everybody was. You can't cover yeah. every angle. We've talked about that before, haven't we? Where, you know, how much, how many cameras would you need to actually prove what you captured was genuine and nobody was there and it was, you know, to actually prove yeah. that that happened. I mean, I heard um, an incredible EVP and I trust the source it came from. But there's a lot of other people that don't know the source point. So query it and don't don't believe it, don't trust it. And it's an incredible EVP. But mm-hmm. what can you do? You can only put it out there for scrutiny, but just accept that you're never going to get that definitive proof because you're always going to get somebody that... That poop is yes. it. And yes, Penny, that is a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> she was in the chat room. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm oh, there she is, yes. <laughs> um, yes, that, I, I had that pretty much that same conversation with somebody. You know, I showed them that video footage and said, look, this is where the six of us were, myself, filming this, or actually it was Mandy, my wife, who filmed the actual apparition itself, or the, the thing that appears in the back wall. But I said, she's there, the rest of us are here. And I can promise you absolutely that is what happened. There was no one else in that room. And they said to me, well, I don't know that because I wasn't there. And I said, well, you can take my word for it. Oh, no, it's up to you. And I said, well, you, know, you might be telling the truth. I wasn't there. I don't know. That was it. You know, there was no way of getting that person to say, well, hang on. Yeah, okay. You're telling me the truth. And I can see there's a figure. Because you can see it. There's something on that back. We'll move across. Mm-hmm. But the, the old catchphrase of back to, well, I wasn't there. I don't know. Is the way of the skeptic getting out of having to accept that Maybe there was something real to it. But, you know, as I said, you that's what I'm saying. You don't get so. Don't, it's not a point getting too caught up in what equipment you're using and having lots of really good gadgets and trying to capture stuff to prove anything. Because the only person you're ever going to prove anything to is yourself. Because you know whether someone chooses to believe it or not, will always be open to interpretation for them. But it's still useful to have all the equipment with you because, like you say, it's on retrospect when you go back and view the footage or listen to the recordings that you've done that sometimes you actually see what you didn't like, didn't recognise at the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we didn't 
I didn't spot that figure at the time she recorded it at all. It just yeah. happened to be we were flying back from Edinburgh to London. And we were, the flight was delayed by about four hours for, for a 50 minute flight, which is quite annoying. <laughs> so, and what's the video footage on the camcorder and the little screen? I thought, hang on, what's that? Mm. And so, I looked at and analyzed, and we managed to get into the vaults later on another occasion. We managed to recreate the shadowing effect to determine there'd have to be a person in the way to create the shadow from the one source of light, which is the camera. And yet, mm. there's only the shadow. No person, so mm. you know, you can, but people can say, Well, no, you that's computer generated, you've made that up on the computer. I can promise you, well, it was done in 2002 or three before well, it was a lot harder to generate such things, but you know, there's no way of proving that. It's, it's it is a shame because there is good evidence out there. But look at us, your last show, we're not going to go, obviously, but you know, we see photographs in the, in the newspapers and on, on the internet, and they always think, ah, oh, it's Photoshop, oh, this is Paradelio, oh, it's this, you know, we we tend to lean that way, even we do, and we're like those who are invested in this stuff, we have a, have a degree of belief in these things, so but we will tend to the sceptic side because it is so easy to fake things. Yeah. Um, Jay? Oh, I, I was agreeing one percent with that. I mean, that's what we were saying on the last show is because so much has been faked for so long that it's hard to put believe anything that's put out there on uh, picture or video. It really is. It I is have a hard time with it, it's and a I very want I want one, to believe. It? It. Oh, absolutely! I, we put in the seven years I've been doing almost seven years now I've been doing this. We put one picture out, and we did have it taken to well the Booth brothers who uh, film and stuff, and we had it. They said. They took it to their cinematographer and stuff and went through it and tried to do, I don't know, they said something about turn it to a negative and it turn it black and white and all this if it stays and I don't know all that crap. And I, I don't, I'm learning, but there's, there's more of a chance of it being some kind of an anomaly. From there, that's the biggest thing with me right now is that once you get people to say that, okay, you have some kind of an anomaly, something that you capture, some kind of, then they want to interpret it. To me, I have the problem with uh, what is it? And everybody, oh, it's a ghost, or it's, it's your Uncle Bob, or it's your Aunt Sally. How do you know that? How, mm-hmm. There's my thing that I have a problem with. Once you, you have that evidence that you can't explain how people want to interpret what it is, I have a big issue with that. Mm. Okay, well, it looks like a good point to have a quick little break, and we'll be right back continuing this conversation. You're listening to Parasearch UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Parasearch UK Radio. Welcome back to the Dark Knight's Paranormal Show. I'm joined tonight by Jay Lynch and by Andy Mercer. Unfortunately, Kerry has had to drop out. Um, welcome back, lads. We were discussing tech and the problems with it. All the problems with it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think sometimes we're... Uh, it's like, well, I don't know about over there, over here. It seems like no matter what you do, everything is over... Equipmentized. I mean, I mean, you can't ride a bicycle nowadays over here, where everybody doesn't have to go buy the latest spandex that uh, Armstrong's riding in, and and you know, and helmet, and it's all gonna. I mean, if you if you like drive a fast sports car, you have to go buy a NASCAR paraphernalia to wear. Everything has to have its own little uniform and equipment, and it's just crazy over here. I don't know if it's that bad over there. Yeah, you do get. You know, everyone's got their like hoodies and their equipment, and you have to have. Or you have to seem to have all the tech if you you're going out. I mean, little paranormal teams are not quite so bad with the tech, I would think. But with the you know investigation teams, people want to come along. They want to see the tech that they've seen on the TV. Um, and you know, it, there is a bit of a chav factor. I think is the expression. <laughs> <laughs> I say that with love in my heart to everybody out there. I don't mean that nasty because I love a hoodie myself. I love a um, a hoodie when I put my when we put my uniform on. You know, it, it gets you gets you in the mood. I, I do love a hoodie, a particularly and, a pretty And why hoodie. does everybody why does everybody have to investigate in black? Oh, what black is, is the my favourite colour? 
you kind of... I, I get that. <laughs> no, I think I get with that, the but black, why? I think with the black factor, if you're taking video footage in that, if you're all in black, then you are not... If you put anything on, like, it can reflect. Like, if you've got, like, a printed T-shirt on, you know, there's... It's that sort of vinyl type look. It could reflect, I suppose. I don't know, but I, that's why I, why I personally wear black in when I'm investigating is because I know then that it's not, my clothing is black, so it's not reflective or it blends yeah, into I, the night, I suppose, is, but is the factor. I would agree with that. No, is, no, that, night, is, that is that camouflage that. for a ghost? <laughs> camouflage for the team. <laughs> so you can but jump my, out on people more. No, no, not like well, that. Well, the, the reason why I question that is because we first got involved with the paranormal investigating stuff. We had an absolutely wonderful night at, at the place we were investigating. We was down a long haul. And our team members sitting in the in the break room, kind of going through their cameras. So I, I, they, I caught a black mass. I caught a black mass. And the next day, you know, we went home, slept, reloaded everything up on the computer, go to exactly that picture, bring it up on the computer. You can see it better. Enlarge it. And it's not a black mass. It's me wearing all black clothes down the hallway. <laughs> so ever since then, we've always worn. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. But you, you have all this chance to get this possibility of it not being because you don't know where somebody else is at, and you catch them something, and you forget that they were there, and you, all of a sudden you have evidence that you really don't have. So ever since then, we've always wore bright colors because now instantly you know if it's one of us in the frame, whether we're, whether it's video, whether it's still photography, you know for a fact. Like I wear a uh, neon safety yellow all the time. You know exactly if one of my team members is in that frame or something like that because they're very distinguished to see because so much can be misinterpreted. That's a fair point, actually. That is a fair point. Yeah. I mean, I tend to go for the dark of the black partly because for the reason you don't stand out so much. You're not necessarily going to cause reflection, as you were just saying. Mm. Also, I think it looks cool. You know, the ghost hunting. Black uh, black and sinister, that's me. I I mean, put it this way, Jay. I do not own any neon clothes. I am black girl. All my my wardrobe is varying shades of black. No, no, I know you do. You've got those neon green pants. I've seen them. <laughs> it's got trousers you're out and about in those I've seen don't get me wrong I do like black it's just when you're investigating I just haven't figured out why everybody always feels that they have to wear dark colors I mean what are you hiding from the ghost I mean like they can't see you you can't see you think you'll be hiding from them oh I'm in the dark so I wear black and the ghost won't see me it'll come in the room and talk to me then really I don't think it's hmm. that at all no, I don't think it's no, I'm, that I'm making a little bit of humor about it don't get me wrong but but it, <laughs> But if you're actually trying to get video evidence and things like that, and you have more than one or two people walking around separately, you have a higher chance of somebody misinterpreting the movement of someone else wearing dark clothes through their little. I mean, you saw the was on that last one we showed on the last uh, show. Yeah. We had that that pur- the purple lines. It didn't reflect that far down the hallway. So if it only if the line only projects twenty feet, you got somebody moving down thirty forty feet. It's going to look like a black mask on that camera on that video when it's not really. It's somebody that's wearing dark clothing and it can't be distinguished because of they're blending into their environment. That is a fair point. I will give you that. All joking aside, that is a fair point. Wow, I got one today. Yes. Oh. You did. I, I'm still going to be wearing my blacks on investigations. Anyway, oh, there was no doubt in that. What is your favorite place to investigate of all the investigations you've done? Um, Andy, where where's been your favourite so far? With a shadow of a doubt, way out there, miles ahead, is Worcester Mansion. Partly because I've been there so many bloody times, I have to say, I, as I keep repeating, I've been, I did more than 50 investigations with Fright Nights alone of Worcester Mansion. And every night I was there, something happened. It was We'd never had a completely flat night. It had variations of um, activity, levels of activity, but there was always something there. So beyond the shadow of a doubt, for me, would just have mentioned. Um, for second, which would be some way back, but still pretty impressive, is the um, Nottingham's uh, uh, Justice Place. I've got Gallery's this Justice. Go to Justice, thank you. I'm blanking there for a second. Go to Justice, yeah. That's quite impressive as well. But yeah, those two would be my number one by miles, and then sort of coming fairly far back, two would be um, the Go to Justice. But yeah, Worcester Mansion is a fantastic place. I don't know if you know about it. It's um, unique. It was a Victorian mansion that was never completed, it was left half finished. There were various sinister stories about why that was the case, but the truth was the guy having it built ran out of money, so um, he couldn't pay anybody, and they all just left. But it's the 
certainly the second, possibly the third building on the same site, and there's definitely elements of the previous building there that can be found. Probably the rear corridor is probably from old Spring House, the previous building. It contains an unconsecrated church, which has been used for black magic in the past and other <laughs> naughties. <It's>, yeah, quite <laughs> monstrous, you can imagine. It's got a cellar to it that has an end room that's quite strangely constructed. There has been suggestions that it's some kind of um, ceremonial room with this um, eight-sided column in the centre of it, like the kind of thing you might see in a church. It's like eight-sided base, and it's, it sort of expands like an umbrella out. And it's quite ornate for a one room of in the cellar at the, at the end of it. It's got a number of definite presences that, are, that definitely predate the building. There's a, a sometimes described as a golem-like creature or troll-like creature seen in that sort of area that's thought to be very old it's got um, sort of black masses moving around it that are amorphous and without sort of form or shape there's a, a tall dark figure that's been seen in the rear corridor on a number of occasions that has a very menacing presence to it um, it is fantastic it really is a wonderful place to investigate I've it's not been there for well, I've not been there for at least five years, I have to say. It's been quite a while since I've been back there, but it's somewhere where I'm quite keen to get to again at some point in the future. It's a fantastic well, we're location. we're still trying to organise that with Chris Howley um, from Ghost yeah. Chasers, isn't it? Um, he, yeah. Their show, we talked to him a little while ago, and it is something we're trying to organise with him at the moment. Um, what about you, Jay? Where's your favourite place to investigate? I would have to say, because I'm like, and the same reason as Andy, is because I've been there so long and I, and I lived there for four and a half years in the building would have to be post town because that's pretty much where we got our paranormal start and we we've, we've dedicated a lot of time to and my second one had to be the old Rhodes hotel because it's just we've had so much activity there and had so much fun yeah you do get like little faves don't you mm. oh absolutely okay so penny's asked a question she said if you're looking at this what's the worst place you've investigated uh-huh. in terms Can you of divulge no activity being cut flat as a pancake, as in nothing. Oh, blimey. Um, what do you reckon, Jay? You go first. I can't think about that. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't have a worse place. I, there's not a place that I have not had. Even when we didn't have that much activity, I still enjoyed the uh, the history and the architecture mm-hmm. of the place. I mean, but I've not come across anything. <laughs> I'll just go with benevolent. How's that? <laughs> I want to see what we were talking about last night. So, I mean, yeah, you with, can't say the D word now, dare you? Well, I just, I just, I don't see the whole dark side of it. I think that's people just wanting to have the attention in that hole. They're they're going in scared, so of course their mind creates what they want to. So I've been in places where they say this dark or demonic or whatever, and and I've had nothing happen in that room. I've sat there by myself for a couple hours, and nothing happened. Do everything they tell me. Don't don't say this. I said it. Yeah. Don't 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 bounce on one foot. Why? I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, absolutely. With you there, Jay. Whatever they say, don't do do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because I'm, because I I I truly believe, like what we discussed last night, most of some of the experiences are what people manifest in their own mind. You have to take yourself out of that mindset if you want to investigate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can think of a couple of places that have initially been rather disappointing because I expected them to be something spectacular. The first one that really comes to mind is the Hellfire Caves, which I don't know if you have heard of over there, but there are there was the Hellfire Club in the 1700s that, depending on which sources you read, were either a drinking club for rich people or dark satanic activity. There are variations, versions of the story of what the Hellfire Club got up to in the 1700s. But they had... A series of man-made caves made. It's a single um, loop of um, caves of little chambers as part of the cave network, all all dug by the locals at the um, great expense of the guy who had them built. And the story behind it was he was actually gave the local workers employment because it was a a period in the 1700s of great um, poverty. And he had a lot of wealth. It was his land. He had these caves built, literally dug into the hillside. Wanted to investigate those for a number of years. It was initially quite difficult because the company that ran them was keen on the idea and eventually the guy who sort of fright nights persuaded them to let him have a go and the first couple of nights were really disappointing we had very little activity it was really quite a shame considering what we knew about the place and its reputation we really expected something quite special and we got very little but the third time we went there it was a totally different story and it really was it's only jumped up to being one of the best public investigations I've been on because we had all sorts of strange activity going on. First and foremost, we had 25 people along for the night. 
who'd paid to, to be there. We had five left by the end of the night that either left early because they felt unwell or people felt dizzy or felt sick or were too frightened to carry on. I had to physically carry one woman out because she'd completely collapsed. So we literally had five people left. And a number of the people who, who pulled out during the night were regulars who'd been on many investigations in the past and had never experienced this level of discomfort before. But we... The things we were getting were really quite strange. The caves themselves, there's nothing physically in them. There are a few sort of statues and the like, but there's no, no chairs or, or tables or anything. But we could hear heavy, low dragging sounds from different sections of the caves. Wherever we were, it was in a different section. But it was like a large old wooden table or a chair being dragged around. It was really quite grating, heavy sound. And at one point, we had this mist that just literally appeared from nowhere that was up, up to about knee height for um, 10, 15 minutes, and then just as quickly vanished. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And it just vanished. It was like, what the hell did that come from? It wasn't misty outside. It wasn't particularly damp or dewy. It was just this mist appeared and then left. And <clears throat> the last part of it, in the deepest section of the caves, one of the people running the event had um, audio equipment with him, which picked up infrared sound and ultrasound, very high frequency. Because there are bats in these caves, and occasionally they would make a tweeting noise as a bat flew by. But in this one last section, the machine... It was quite literally singing. It was actually making what sounded like notes, like mm, 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 very, very high, 40,000 plus hertz, incredibly high frequency. And he said the only thing that can generate that kind of sound is heavy machinery, high pitch vibrations from heavy machinery. But we were 200 feet underground. There was no rivers nearby, no underground streams, nothing. And yet here was this weird noise that this machine was picking up. And only in this rear section, the very deepest section of the Hellfire Cave. So that was <clears throat> went from being probably the most disappointing site to that third investigation being incredible. And the fourth time, back to before, hardly anything. The old noise or stone being thrown, but then it's got pebble stones across the whole floor of the entire cave's network. So you're going to get the odd sting get kicked up by accident. But of the four investigations I was involved in, Three of them were like, this is rubbish. <laughs> but that one was incredible. What about you, Jay? What's your worst? Like I said, I don't... I, we've had some locations that were very, very <laughs> slow. But, okay, Mansfield Reformatory was one of the slowest investigations I think I've ever had and the least responsible for what I was getting into. I mean, you think someplace where Shawshank Redemption was filmed, the history of all the deaths there, that it would be absolutely crazy. And it really wasn't. But I was so mesmerized by the architecture and, and everything that was there. It was, I lost myself in looking at that and the history of it than what I did in investigating. So I think part of that experience that night was me not paying attention to what was going on around me because I was too busy looking at the building. So that's, imagine that it was me. I'm the problem. Mm. <laughs> well, what yeah. about you, Kerry? You haven't I'm said sorry. yourself best, but your yeah. most favorite least. To be fair, I have to say my best. Um, investigation was a pub that we went to as a private pub I can't name it but I loved that pub I thought it was great there was loads of activity um, loads of like feelings and stuff like that really enjoyed that one um, until I got thrown across the room um, and then it didn't turn out to be quite so fun after that Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that location we did it a couple of times and I really really enjoyed I really enjoyed that and because it hadn't been over investigated it was like um you know, raw territory. Yeah. So it was really, really good. Um, the worst I've been to, I think, not in regards to activity, but just because it was cold and miserable mm-hmm. and it was just bitter, it was absolutely bitterly cold. Um, and I'm I'm not one for bailing out early, but this place we had to because it was just minus, minus figures. Do you know what I mean? It just... Yeah. was unbearable and that was um a tithe barn but that had it was packed full of residual but not particularly active but it was it was a very um full of resi- residual energy and we had some great scrying um ac- you know like uh, experiments um in mm-hmm. that place um and it's not again it's not overly investigated so um those are probably the two that I I would go back to Tithe Barn. I would definitely go back there um, to investigate, but I don't do it on not quite such a chilly evening. And everybody was the same, everybody on the team. And we even had um, 
a guest from a different team on with us that night and he was saying this is unreal how cold it was um and we'd all layered up you know we'd all done you know what you need to do for an investigation but it was just unbearably cold um so this leads me on to my next question for you guys now personally i do love a wood i do love woods in the middle of the night i'm a bit of a sucker for those what about yourselves what what do you prefer indoor or outdoor go ahead Andy. Mm-hmm. Personally speaking, I do prefer indoor simply because you're not um, at risk of the weather. Obviously, there are some very interesting woods. We were at one a couple of weeks ago called Epping Forest and, and Clapham Wood, both of which have had some activity. Clapham more so, although, as we've seen, it's been rather transformed and is kind of disappearing a little bit. But uh, certainly Epping Forest is interesting. But also there's woods near us, Billericay, Norsey Woods, which is a nickname, part of it, the Devil's Wood, which is there's a story behind that one. So I do personally enjoy trumpeting around a wood at night, but you are at risk of the weather. So internal investigations, you have that's less of a problem. Um, funny enough, just to quickly go back to something we were talking about before about sceptics and convincing people. I can give you one quick story about how somebody was actually he was actually converted from being an out and out sceptic to thinking, hey, bloody hell, I saw that. And that weather comes into is why I mentioned it. We did, um, again, we'll just to mention my favourite place, we had a dry thunderstorm, which is basically the thunder and lightning, but no rain. And during the storm, we had a lot of activity, to say the least. And we were on the first floor in a main central corridor. And between the flash, during the flashes of lightning, you could see there were figures at the far end of the corridor. Now, we know full well there was there's nobody other than our group in the buildings, I say. And yet, just every now and again, with a flash of light, you could see there was a tall figure standing there. And <clears throat> what had happened was, when I we meet up in a local pub, and I, did, I had to keep quiet as that I'm part of the company and sort of just get people's reactions when you're talking to them. And I was talking to this chap and wife, and the wife was there because she wanted to be there, but the husband was like, he said, basically, I'm just here for her. She wants to be, I don't really believe in this one of this. Um, BS, shall we say? Um, I don't really believe any of it. And later on, when he realised I was part of the company, he actually apologised and said, "You know, I was, didn't mean to be rude, mate, but I'm not a believer." I said, "No, it's fine. Don't worry about it." Anyway, end of the night, him and his wife come over to me. And his wife saying, "You got to tell him. Go and tell him. Tell him what happened." Turns out, she and he were at the front of the group, and they saw the figures. And he said to me. I don't really believe in this stuff, mate, but I know what I saw. I know what I saw. That was there. That was bloody amazing. So he was still saying he wasn't really a believer, but he accepted he'd seen something he could not possibly explain. So the thunderstorm helped. So I think if you're out and about and it starts to get thunder and lightning, that can really be nice and spooky. As long as it's in the pot and rain afterwards. (laughs) Sounds fantastic. (laughs) Yeah. That's the one occasion that stands out with somebody who came definitely a not believing sceptic to having to accept he'd seen something he could not explain. And he said it wasn't just once, it was several times. Every time that lightning flashed, I could see that figure. There was someone standing there. That would, that would actually, that would be a, a scary moment, wouldn't it? I have to say, I think, I mean, I'm, I'd say I'm pretty brave in investigations. I get in there and I, you know, that's what I'm there for and I want to experience it and whatnot. But that, I think, might have been, I might have been a bit like, oh my God, that's a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> What about yourself, well, every time Jay? the light flashed, every time the light flashed, you heard, oh, ah, <laughs> <laughs> What about yourself, Jay? I'm, most of my paranormal investigating, I've done inside, but uh, I love investigating the woods, whether it be paranormal. I've also spent a lot of time out there doing a lot of uh, tracking for cryptids. Uh, I work with a group for that. I've spent some time trying to track supposed sightings of Dogman, Bigfoot, whatever, also doing urban legends investigating. So, yeah, I, I'll... I love both of them, and and the woods is just a different area for me. I usually don't do paranormal too much in the woods because they're always like, oh, I saw Bigfoot. I'm like, okay, let's go find a track. Let's go see what we can get. (laughs) So it's a different investigation for me in the woods. That's true. Just while we're talking, I have actually got – now, I have my children are at home tonight, and I'm just hoping that it's they're asleep in bed and not actually causing this, but there's a knocking coming from the stairwell. (laughs) And I'm looking at this stairwell thinking, okay, do I need to go and check the children? (laughs) Talking of urban legends. Keep keep talking about them. If you find a corner around on the ceiling, I'd get worried if I were you. (laughs) Well, yeah, if that happens, I'll be like definitely um, getting a bit worried. 
But there's this weird, no- I say it's like a weird knocking noise. And um, I say, I'm, they better be in bed, is all I'm saying. Yes. But I did, a, um, on a previous um, station, I w- we were doing a show on, on the D's, you know, that bad word. And um, <laughs> before, before we went Make, live... Make my presence, don't worry. <laughs> lit- I know. But literally, just before we went live, I was alone. The kids were with their dad that weekend, and I was alone in the house. The dog was by my feet. And there was this almighty bang from upstairs just before I went live to talk about this. And I was sitting there going, something's just gone off upstairs. I'm going to go and have a quick look. So it was like, oh, okay, fine. Anyway, I came on. We literally went on air and it happened again. And then every time we discussed that show afterwards on Skype or whatever, my Skype crashed. Oh, God. <laughs> it was a really strange experience. And touch wood, I'm, I'm, and I am actually touching wood right now, I um, haven't had that since. But, yeah, that was another little weird experience I had whilst on the radio. Have you had any experiences whilst live on air, Andy? Oh, good. I'm glad you came to me because, yes, I can actually tell you something as well. Um, also a bit of a, a, a promo. From tomorrow night onwards and um, Saturday nights, we're going to have the KTPF Reload Show, which is the old show I used to be involved in for a couple of years that ran for about five, over four years on every week live for between two and three hours. And it was my friend Steve and Sue, to Steve and Sue Taggart who actually um, run the show, and I joined them in the last sort of year of its life sort of keeping it moving on but we had some fantastic interviews we did some very interesting stuff we had a couple of live investigations on air and one particular one which was really quite strange we had a chap called john blackburn who used to run an event company called mysterious panel events now runs enigma events and he had hooked up with this guy who owned a very strange painting now i won't go the whole story because it's going to be one of the interviews i'm going to replay fairly soon but in a nutshell the painting itself portrays an image that is quite disturbing it's a little bit like if you've ever seen edward monk's the scream it's an image a little bit like that of this rather distorted face open mouth apparently screaming and it's got quite a strange backstory that it may have been painted by someone who survived the holocaust and um, was painting of their own pain and suffering but it seems the painting is haunted it's very odd painting and has been known to move by itself i mean vibrate and people have touched it and feel it moving and i actually observed the temperature on the surface of the painting dropped by 20 degrees in about two minutes, which is pretty impressive. Wow. But we had, I know, it's, it's really quite a strange um, picture. It, it's disturbing to even look at, but the picture itself, it has paranormal activity around it. But we tried to do a live event investigation of the painting live in the studio and, um, um, John brought the painting in, and he actually, cause what they used to do, they had it live on camcorders. So you could actually watch the show as well as listen to it. It was on live stream. And we had some very strange sounds picked up live as we were going out. Cause we recorded the show, but it was going out live. Mm. And people in the chat room were saying, there's weird noises. They're hearing strange metallic sounds they'd never heard before or since. Now, very well on the show around for four years, every night, never heard them before or since. And we actually caught them, I say, on the, on the recording. And it seems to be something to do with this weird painting these very strange sounds so that was that was pretty amazing night i must admit that was quite a definite we were going to let the odd occasional strange thing occur whilst live but well, I, I do talk about things like cognitive bias that because you're talking about that paranormal you, you tend to notice stranger things when you're talking about it mm-hmm. but no that that show that night was pretty strange and it's not this week's but it'll be one i'll be putting up fairly soon because it is really quite unusual so yes we've had strange stuff happen live on air Excellent. What's your show um, tomorrow about? Tomorrow's show, the first one, is an interview with the Reverend Lionel Fanthorpe, who is quite well known. He used to do a program, I forget what it was called, actually, a TV show about the paranormal years and years ago. He's an ordained um, Church of England vicar, but he's also a martial arts expert. He used to be a headmaster, and he's written dozens and dozens of books on ghosts and the paranormal and supernatural. Um I've chosen him as the, as the for the first show because it's actually the most number of replays. It's had over twelve hundred replays on the YouTube channel, so I'm kind of going by the ones that've been the most popular. But he was he's a fascinating chap to talk to. Um, we did two interviews with him, and on the second one, we suggested would you like to come on another show and discuss demons with me? And he he demurred. He, he decided not to do it. So. No. He chickened out, which is a kind of a shame, really. <laughs> <laughs> Debate, I'm sure, but no, he didn't fancy it. <laughs> what about you, but no. Jay? Sorry, Andy, what? cut you off there. What about That's you, Jay? Have you had anything weird happen to you whilst you've been live on the radio? Just 
uh, when we still lived in Post Town, we first started broadcasting with the other network that we were on. Uh, people would say that they could hear things moving around, but I think it was just because they knew where we were at, knew that we were that we lived inside Post Elementary School, lived inside a haunted location. So I think it's more their minds wanting to hear something in the background because I don't, I never heard them. Even when I went back and listened to them back in, in the archives, I just, I'm like, no, nah, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that. Yeah. So, so I really haven't personally experienced it, but we've had people claim it. But like I said, I think it's just due to where we were broadcasting from. It's um very uh, we, but you're right, Andy, when you say that it's because you're talking about it, you you know you you're it you'd be more aware of it, so you know you pick up on things um, that are happening. So it's all probably coincidences. That's what I'm putting it down to anyway. Particularly when I'm alone in my own home, I'm like, yeah, that's just, <laughs> just, just settling noise. It's just the boiler. It's fine. It's just the boiler. <laughs> It's just a ball that's growling my name. It's perfectly fine. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. <laughs> Although when I was a teenager, I um, obviously I lived with my parents and I was home alone again and the dog just started growling at nothing. And I swear, mm. from upstairs, I heard a really deep male voice shout my name. And I literally grabbed the dog, hightailed it out of there as fast as I could. <laughs> and what, I kept phoning until someone was home. I was like, are you home? And they're like, well, Yeah. I said, right, and come home now. I'm safe. <laughs> so no. yeah, I've had to, I have had that happen when I've been alone, but not in this house. That was in, as I say, my parents' house. And weird stuff used to happen in that that house as well. Quite often, we'd wake up and all the taps would be running, and the hob. It used to like turning the gas rings, all the gas rings on the hob. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah, I know. My dad used to say, "Will you stop doing that? Your course is costing me a fortune." <laughs> <laughs> and um because my dad's a really light sleeper so he used to hear the banging up um, it sounded he said it sounds like somebody is walking up the stairs gets halfway up and then there's like a loud bang and then they walk back down the stairs well before the house that we lived in was there it was a bungalow and so we used to joke that he used to walk halfway up the stairs hit his head on the ceiling and realize he can't <laughs> go any farther <laughs> <laughs> so we used to make quite light of it um but in my teenage years I wasn't it scared me in my teenage years but it doesn't scare me now um but then I think age is a wonderful thing don't you not think guys yeah absolutely it's, it's one of those things you know again I've said all the years I've been doing this apart from being hit by a couple of stones nothing's ever hurt me directly I mean I've seen people sort of I mean one guy just very briefly on a front night event has got spooked silly he, he screamed so it's like a girl and ran straight into a closed door <laughs> and it was actually a marine he was actually on leave he was an army marine and he screamed and ah! <laughs> ran into the door that was completely closed <laughs> just oh, and almost knocked him. himself out <laughs> oh that's quite I, that's I know hysterical. you shouldn't laugh I know you shouldn't laugh but that's quite funny you I've never screamed on an investigation I'll be I'm putting that out I probably will now the next investigation I do they're going to go spirit are going to go yeah we'll get her this time but no um <laughs> I've never actually screamed on an investigation. What about you, Jay? Have you ever screamed and run for the hills? Nope. No, I usually, when everybody else starts screaming, I start falling to the floor laughing. So if it's <laughs> actually something evil and somebody's going to get possessed or something like that, I'm the one that's going to get had because I can't run because I'm too busy laughing. <laughs> I was just trying to counter that Hollywoodization we were talking about yesterday where people expect all these nasty, horrible things to happen to them. They just don't happen. You know, you far more likely to sort of trip over something in the dark than um, actually be pushed or attacked by a demonic force or evil monster or ghostly things, you know. I mean, I've seen a couple of strange cuts. I mean, there was one, again, my favourite place, Woodchester Mansion, this is why it's my favourite place. A guy walking down the steps directly in front of me felt his back, so he felt really hot. When we looked, there were three long scratches that had just literally appeared on his back. You know, each one was a good six inches long, and yet we checked his clothes. He was wearing a T-shirt and a fleece. He wasn't wearing a chain. There was nothing in his clothing that would have could have scratched that way. There wasn't even like a... The, the label on the coat was very th- a soft piece of material, so it wasn't even that. And they were quite fresh. You could see they were quite, mm. you know, they'd only recently been and t- touched the back of your hand. They were really quite warm. And that was literally, the guy was right in front of me. As they were, I mean, I didn't see them happen in his clothes, but Jim, I knew him quite well. He was a, a, a member of a group called Paranormal Gateway, which he used to be involved with. And he was like, my back's really suddenly got hot. Can you have a look at it? And I said, yeah, you've got three scratches down your back. And I remember if we were saying last night, Jay, about three scratches means it's the devil oh, or God. the yeah. or something. Yeah, I was over thinking here. That as he was talking, I was thinking, well, we yeah. talked about that last night about the demon thing. Well, you know, the three scratches. I, I did some research on that because I couldn't remember why they say that because it's 
it's just like the pentagram when you turn it upside down. It's the opposite. It's it's the opposite of the Holy Trinity. It's the you know the number three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. No, it's it's three marks of the uh, the evil side. I'm like seriously. Oh really? Yeah. Aren't we stretching know. things quite far? Somewhat. Hmm. Anyway, lads, on that note, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thanks for having me. Because the show's what? now done. We're now running out of time. We could carry on, couldn't we? We always could. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining me. Mark, I hope you feel better. Um, and we that's why we didn't do the show on the Voynich, um manuscript tonight, because they're poorly, Mark. So, um, But thank you again to Jay and Andy for joining me um, and saving my bacon. Otherwise... I would have had to have chatted for an hour all by myself. And I'm, I, you don't could have like, done I don't it. like doing that. I just don't like doing that. Anyway, you can work. catch us on Podbean. You can catch us on um, the YouTube. You can catch us on, where else are we? The Internet Archive. And check us out on Facebook, parasearch.co.uk. And uh, we will see you for all the shows next week. And don't forget, Andy's show going tomorrow at 9 p.m. Is that, Andy? It is indeed, as I say, it's um, <clears throat> a rerun of some fantastic interviews that the KTP have conducted over the years. It's well worth a listen. Excellent. We'll definitely be tuned in for that. And on that note, good night, guys. Good night. Good night. You're listening to Parasearch UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Parasearch UK Radio.